Good morning once again. For today's video, I am going to discuss the different types of the fingerprint patterns. These fingerprint patterns include the arches, the loop, and the whirl. Among the three patterns, arches is the least pattern since it covers only the 5% of the entire population then followed by the world pattern, which covers 30% of the population, whereas the loop pattern covers the highest percentage of the population, which is 65%. In other sources, loops cover 60-65% to and world patterns covers 30-35% to of the population. In this video, I am going to discuss the loop patterns pattern which covers the highest percentage of the population or covers the 60 to 65 percent of the population consists of two types. We have there the radial loop and we have there the ulnar loop. Radial covers 6 percent and the ulnar loop covers the 94 percent. is the type of the fingerprint pattern in which one or more ridges enter upon either side and then recurve, touch or pass an imaginary line between the delta and the core, and then pass out or tend to pass out upon the same side of the ridge entered. In other words, a loop pattern must have a delta in a core, and it must have a ridge count of at least one. Likewise, it must have a sufficient recurve wherein it is not spoiled. These three actually are the elements of a loop pattern. Later, we are going to discuss one by one the elements. The first element of the loop pattern were in it must have a delta and a core. If you have watched my previous video regarding the analysis of different fingerprint characteristics and formations, I have discussed there the different rules in locating the delta and the core. So in our first example, we have here the dot ridge. Since this is a dot ridge, this will be our delta. And our core will be located here since we do not have any rod or bar. So the location of our core is on the farthest shoulder of a recurving ridge farthest to the delta. On our second example, since this is our first obstruction, this will be the location of our delta. And this will be the location of our core on the top or summit of the rod. Okay, As long as the rod rises, rises as high as the shoulders of the the curving ridge or the loop. So this will be our core. On our last illustration, since this is a bifurcation, our delta will be located somewhere here. And the location of our core is the same with our second example. It must be located on the top or summit since we have here one rod or bar. So this is the location of our delta and the core. Our second element is that it must have a ridge count of at least one. So when we talk about ridge count, okay, so these are actually the ridges which intervenes if we are going to draw an imaginary line between the delta and a core. Again, when we talk about ridge count, these are the intervening ridges between the delta and a core when we are going to draw an imaginary line. So in this first example, we have there one ridge count. Since this ridge is being touched or crossed when we have there the imaginary line. On our second example, again, the intervening ridges between the delta and the core. So in here we have two ridges that was touched or crossed. In here we have 
two, we have here two reach count. On the first one, we have only one. And on our last example is that between the delta and the core, we have three ridges that was touched or crossed when we draw the imaginary line between the delta and the core. So we have here three reach count. Take note that reach counting is only applicable to loop patterns. And I will be discussing the rules in reach counting. In cases that you have encountered these patterns, just like on our third example, the uh, counting of ridges should be like this. So, of course, if this is a single ridge, the count will be 1. Okay. So there. So, this is 1. And this is one since it only touches one ridge and of course this one one ridge okay we also have there one ridge now of course when we encounter this uh, two ridges that has been touched even if it came from a single ridge okay the ridge count will be two so we have there 1 and then 2, we have there 1 and then 2, when we draw a, an imaginary vertical line. So in here we have there 2, there we have there 2. Now the question is, what if we encounter this particular part wherein there is meeting or convergence of two ridges, okay, even in here? We have their converging or meeting of two ridges. So how are we going to reach count this? These are now under the rules are considered two ridges. Okay? So if the imaginary line that was drawn from the delta to core touches the meeting or the converging part of the ridges, then the reach count must be two. And for our last element for the loop patterns, it must have a sufficient recurve, which is not actually spoiled. When we talk about a sufficient recurve, it consists of the space between the shoulders of a loop. These are the shoulders of a loop, wherein it is free from any appendages. So the shoulders of a loop are the points at which the recurving ridge definitely turns inward or definitely curves. So this will be our shoulders here. Okay, so these are our shoulders. Mm -hmm. Again, these are the part where in the uh, loop actually recurve or uh, turns inward yeah. so these are our shoulders of a loop that what makes the uh, loop sufficient or the recurving ridge sufficient now it says there it should not be spoiled so meaning it should not be spoiled or it must be free from any appendage so if you're going to observe here there are no appendage again when we talk appendage these are uh, ridges which appears at a right angle on the outside of the recurve or on the top or summit of the recurve or the loop there. In other words, these are not considered as an element of the loop pattern, but these are considered the sufficient recurve. So the elements of a loop pattern First is we have there that it must have a delta and we have there the core. Second is we must have a ridge count of at least one. If we are going to draw an imaginary line between the core and the delta, there are intervening ridges. In here we have three ridge count. And of course the last element that there must be a sufficient recurve. 
wherein it must be free from any appendage. Moving on, this is again another example. So the elements again of a loop pattern is first, we have here the delta and the core, and then followed by the reach count. In here, we have 14 reach count. You're going to count, we have there 14 intervening ridges when we draw this red line and then last element is it must have a sufficient recurve wherein it must be free from any appendage or it must not be spoiled again remember the three elements of a loop pattern for you to easily memorize remember this three acronym we have there the drs D stands for the delta and the core, R for the reach count, and S for the sufficient recurve. Moving on, let us now proceed with the different types of a loop pattern. So first, we have there the radial loop, wherein the ridges flows or runs towards the radius bone or the thumb, towards the thumb. Secondly, is we have there the ulnar loop, wherein those ridges tends to flow or runs towards the ulna bone or the little finger. So in this first example, if this is our fingerprint pattern, if you are going to observe this ridges tends to go or runs towards the ulna bone. So this is considered as an ulnar loop. In this example, these are taken from the right hand. Okay? Now on the second example is that the ridges in the fingerprint pattern tends to go towards the radius bone or towards the thumb. So this is considered as the radial loop. On our third example is that if you are going to check the ridges, again, the ridges turns to run towards the ulna bone or the little finger so this is our little finger therefore this pattern is considered as an ulnar loop on the fourth example here the ridges tends to run towards the thumb or the radius bone so this is considered as the radial loop and last the ridges appearing on the fifth example is that the ridges runs towards the ulna bone. Therefore, this is considered as an ulnar loop. More examples on the radial loop and the ulnar loop. So in this example, these are actually an example of fingerprint patterns on a fingerprint record card. So in a fingerprint record card, on the uh, first five or on the top part, this will consist the fingers coming from the right hand. And on the lower part, this uh, fingerprint blocks belongs to the left hand. Okay, so I repeat, on this first block, on the upper portion, this uh, first block, second block, third block, fourth block, and the fifth block on the upper portion of the fingerprint record card is intended for the right hand fingers. So this will be from the right thumb. This will be from the right index. The third block comes from the middle finger. The fourth block came from the ring finger and the fifth block came from the right little finger. Next is the opposite. On the sixth block, we have there the left thumb. On the seventh block, we have there the left index finger. On the eighth block, is we have there the left middle finger. And on the ninth, ninth block is we have there the left ring finger. And on the last 
block or the tenth block is we have there the left little finger. So in here we are going to identify whether these are uh, whether these are the whether these are the uh, radial loop or an ulnar loop. So on the first block, we can observe that the ridges run towards the ulnar. Again, we are going to use this as our reference since it is the same that it, the fingers are taken from the right hand. So this runs towards the ulna bone. So this is considered as an ulnar loop. Next is this. The ridges tends to run towards the radius bone. So this is a radial loop. Next is we have here the third block. The ridges runs towards the ulna bone. Therefore, this is an ulnar loop. On the fourth one is we have there fourth block. The ridges run towards the radius bone. So this is radial. And next on the fifth block is we have there the ridges tends towards to go on the ulna bone or the little finger so this is actually the ulnar loop on the sixth block again we are not going to use this as a reference since this is taken from the right hand so in this example it must be the opposite okay so in this sixth block the ridges run towards the radius bone of the left hand therefore this is a radial loop. On the seventh block, the ridges run towards the ulna bone of the left hand. Therefore, this is an ulnar loop. On the eighth block, the ridges, same with the sixth block, the ridges run towards the radius bone. Therefore, on the eighth block, this is considered as the radial loop. And on the ninth block, the ridges, the same with the seventh block, the ridges run towards the ulna bone of the left hand. Therefore, this is an ulnar loop. And on the tenth block, the ridges run towards the ul ulna bone. Okay. We have there the ulna bone, just like the seventh and the ninth block. Therefore, our fingerprint pattern on the 10th block is considered an ulnar loop. So I hope you are able to memorize the distinction between the ulnar loop and the radial loop. Again, when a loop enters and exits from the thumb side of the hand, the pattern will always be radial loop. So these are radial since this is taken from the right hand. Now, when a loop enters and exits from a pinky finger, the pattern will always be an ulnar loop. So, there are no exemptions to this rule. Now, if we are going to use the left hand, the answers for this will be opposite. That's it. So thank you for watching our video lecture on fingerprint patterns.